yes, there is going to be substantial rate cuts that are being anticipated all the way to 2026. So in other words, in the next year and a half or so, maybe about 2% reduction is what's anticipated. And this factors in the anticipation that the U.S. economy is going to be cooling. Inflation is going to come down and the labor market is going to become more sluggish. However, the picture is also telling us that beyond 2026, short-term interest rates are anticipated to be nudging up. That's what folks are betting. Hi, everyone. We are so excited to be joined by Kingler Flag Business School for another quarterly roundtable discussion on current market trends. So let's go ahead and get started. Jacob, want to take us away with mortgage market update? Hey, everyone. So I think what we'll do today is we'll start from the you know very big picture, very top national type of issues that concern real estate here in the triangle, and then we will narrow our way down as the presentation proceeds. You know, obviously, the one of the most important macro variables that influence demand for purchasing homes is interest rates. So, and of course, mortgage rates. We've all heard recently about mortgage cuts that are anticipated. Some some of these things have been kicked down the road, but it's looking right now, especially given the way that uh, inflation is coming down, that the labor market is starting to show signs of cooling, that we are going to see rate cuts. And the, the bets out there on Wall Street are pretty heavy that we're, uh, the first one's going to happen in September. If you look at overall market indicators that look further than, say, September, down the road, even several years down the road, we can get a sense of where the market thinks short-term rates, the federal funds rate, which on, on which all interest rates are somewhat based and which are set by the Federal Reserve. So we can get a sense of where this is going to go over the next few years. And the uh, graph here on the slide is giving us a picture. This is the kind of data that comes from futures markets. Futures markets are markets where all kinds of market players are are hedging and betting where interest rates are going to be. It's a multi, 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 hundreds of trillions of dollars type of market. And so one way to think about it is that it's it's our it, it's our best guess in a competitive market environment of where interest rates are going to go. And let me see from the slide there is that, yes, there is going to be substantial rate cuts that are being anticipated all the way to 2026. So in other words, in the next year and a half or so, maybe about 2% reduction is what's anticipated. And this factors in the, the anticipation that the, the U.S. economy is going to be cooling. Uh, inflation is going to come down and the labor market is going to become more sluggish. However, the picture is also telling us that beyond 2026, short-term interest rates are expected or anticipated to be nudging up. That's what folks are betting. That's the bet that's clearing the market right now. Why would that be happening? Likely because if rates aren't going to come down by about 2%, that's that's going to be, as I said earlier, on baking in some cooling in the economy. But the economy is not going to be cold for a long time. So at some point, the Federal Reserve is going to want to bring back interest rates to a level where they have what we like to call dry powder. It gives the Federal Reserve's the ability to shift rates down quickly if they need to or play around with it. If, if if they permanently keep rates down very, very low, that actually creates a problem for them, for them if we enter into a crisis situation. So they want to have some of that dry powder, which is arguably why we're seeing rates nudging down to what might be deemed a historical level where the Fed might like it to be. The big point is that we're not going to go back to the 20 teens where we saw very, very low interest rates for a very long time. And the reason we have very low interest rates for a very long time in the 20 teens is because it took a very long time to recover from the global recession of 2008, 2009, especially the labor market took a very long time to recover. Relative to that time, we've recovered. So th this is what the interest rate picture is telling us. Now, that's short-term rate. If we can go to the next slide, we can see how that translates into mortgage rates. So mortgage rates are going to come down, likely. But it's not going to be step in step with short term rates. And in other words, mortgage rates are not going to be anticipated to be coming down by as much as 
maybe a full percentage point, as you can see here on the graph, right down to maybe five and a half percent. And that's going to nudge up as well as we anticipate rates to come to long-term equilibrium. So what's happening here is that mortgage rates reflect not just what's happening in the short-term interest rate market, but also they're reflecting what's going to happen in the longer term. And so if in the longer term, we're expecting interest rates to short-term interest rates to have around 4%, makes sense for mortgage rates, as we see here in the picture, to be nudging up as well. So unfortunately for those folks who are really, really, really hoping that we're going to come back down to be able to refinance or finance a home purchase at 3.5%, that doesn't look very likely, at least from the information that we can glean currently in markets. But we don't know everything, and stuff could happen. Um, unanticipated things can happen, and it is possible that mortgage rates may be reduced further. So I think it's worthwhile trying to think, well, gosh, what will knock mortgage rates back down to 4% or, or maybe even lower? Generally speaking, economists will tend to think that Things that end up leading to lower rates correspond to bad stuff, either bad stuff for us here in the U.S. or bad stuff for people who are not in the U.S. So let me break that down for us. Interest rates tend to come down when we need folks to borrow more in order to be able to invest. And in other words, and, and we need that when the economy is cooling. So if we do face a major recession or financial crisis that will force the Federal Reserve to cut rates much more deeply than anticipated in the graphs we showed earlier, then that will likely impact mortgage rates as well. But I wouldn't root for that. This is not something I think we want to root for. Bad news for the U.S. economy that would cause the Federal Reserve to steeply cut interest rates. The other thing that could affect mortgage rates, demand for U.S. government uh, treasury securities. In other words, if, if everybody out there in the world is vying to put their money in a safe harbor, and the USA is deemed as a safe harbor, then that is going to allow the US government to borrow at lower rates. And that's going to translate also into lower mortgage rates down the road. That type of thing uh, may be linked to a global economic uncertainty that is going to impact folks in other countries, not necessarily our country. So th those are the two things that could impact rates. And as I said, we're not really anticipating that right now. At least the market isn't. So that, of course, brings us to the question that a lot of folks have on their mind, which is, well, if rates aren't going to come down by a huge amount, maybe a percentage point, which is nice, right? I, I'll, we'll take that. But maybe I shouldn't be banking or waiting for rates to come down to four or three and a half percent. What should I do right now? What, what are my alternatives? And here, I'm, at least in my opinion, I, I don't think that we have a lot of great alternatives for the, the typical want to be homeowner. So one alternative to the 30-year fixed rate mortgage uh, or conventional fixed rate mortgage, which uh, is essentially a subsidized loan and the subsidy is essentially coming from the U.S. government through the government-sponsored enterprises, quaintly known as Fannie or Freddie, you could borrow an adjustable rate mortgage. Adjustable rate mortgages charge you a rate that fluctuates in time, and usually that short-term rate tends to be lower than the 30-year fixed rate mortgage. However, right now, that's not the case, and that's because short-term rates are kind of higher, or at least as high as long-term rates. So adjustable rate mortgages might have been great, or might be great when short-term rates are really low and long-term rates are high. That's not what we're seeing right now. That's not a great alternative. How about seller refinancing? And uh, that's been getting some press recently. So the idea that maybe you can cut a deal with a seller and be able to finance through them, potentially at a lower rate. Finding seller refinancing, uh, uh, sorry, it's seller financing that is actually a good deal for the buyer is a rare thing. And that's because an individual seller is is facing a lot more risk than, say, a bank or the DSCs, Fannie and Freddie. And so they're going to need to be compensated for the higher risk of lending out to an individual. So that's going to translate either into a higher house cost or a higher interest rate. You're going to have to give up one of these things. And again, we have to remember the GSC 30-year uh, uh, um, subsidized fixed rate mortgage is essentially subsidized. It's going to be really hard to beat that when you take into account all of the economics. How about rent to own? Here too, we have the same kind of, an, uh, of uh, 
uh, a situation where you have to cut a deal with the seller. And the seller is going to want to be compensated for the fact that they're not selling right now. They, you know, they're effectively having to hang on to that property. And so they will need to be compensated in one way or another for that additional risk. And finally, uh, shared appreciation financing, that has been getting some press as well. That's the idea that as a homeowner, I buy property, I'll give up some of the upside down the road when I'm going to sell by sharing any capital gains with the lender. And I'll give that up in return for lower interest rate. And that can work. And it has been tested in other countries, the UK in particular. The I would say that the jury is still out about whether this this is a good deal for buyers. Yeah, it's not so clear. And in this country, this type of lending arrangement is done through the private sector. And once again, it will not enjoy the kind of subsidies or indirect subsidies that uh, fixed rate mortgages enjoy through Fannie and Freddie. So it's if you're going to go with a shared appreciation type of mortgage, you're going to have to give up some upside down the road. And the bottom line is that from an economic point of view, most economists would say that it's probably not worth it. You'd, you'd be better off trying to get that higher down payment and get the GSC fixed rate mortgage. So, sorry. Hey, Jacob. Hey, Jacob. Hey, Jacob. Yes, sir. Uh, Jacob, this is Matt. That's, uh, 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 this is really great information. And I wanted to point to Randy Cox, who's a broker or part- practitioner out there every day talking to buyers who are probably asking them these exact questions. Like, wow, Randy, the rate's really high. What do you think? What do you think about these these options, Randy? I know you probably point people to conventional first, just as Jacob was saying. But if that's hard for them, what's your like? What's next as a way to try to get people into a house? Well, and and there's so many pieces to to what was just presented. Um, and and you know, I'm also a, a licensed general contractor builder. And I and I think we're in a in a place right now where the Federal Reserve needs to move interest rates for a number of different reasons. And you know, Matt pointed out earlier that that new home construction is outpacing residential resale. And then we've got this locked in effect where a number of homeowners they have a three percent, two point seven five percent interest rate. Builders, in a sense, of also because of where interest rates are have held off on starting new projects and and developers the same. And so, you know, we're trying to talk with, and I sent out a a recent post where, you know, you really never know where the bottom is and where things are going to start moving in a, in a different direction. And I think this fall and this Q4 is probably going to be a, a great time, if not one of the best times to purchase because of interest rates starting to trend in in a positive direction for the consumer. Um, But then also, hopefully, if interest rates can come to a place where maybe it's, you know, high fives, mid fives for those folks that have the low, the lower mortgages from when they purchased during COVID or or pre-COVID, then some of that inventory that is is resale type inventory comes to market as well. Um, and then also to, to add to it, if those interest rates come down, the federal funds rate comes down, then we have an opportunity for builders and developers to start on projects, which, you know, it, it can be a slippery slope where we don't want for there to be a lull in production. And I, I think that we're in a place right now where we can manage it in such a way and and hopefully minimize any negative impact and start to get housing will bring us out of whatever down economy we we're in and usually that's the case and and I think we can get the the real estate market moving in a positive way in Q4 and and throughout Q5 to where we can avoid any type of what people are suggesting might be a recessionary type of climate. And, and I think we're in a place where we can avoid that. So, yeah, thanks, Randy. Um, I, I'm going to ask one more question and we'll move on with, with the slide deck under shared appreciation, appreciation financing. I know that some of our fractional startups in the RTP area have shared appreciation as part of their business model. That if you buy a house with acre or with ownify 
or some of the other, these are sponsors of ours, so I'm trying to remember them all. Uh, um, these companies have a model that they they do, you know, expect you to share some of the property appreciation, but they market it like, you know, like you're, if you have a, a co-buyer, like a parent helping you out, Acre also handles repairs and you know, HVAC outages that a millennial buyer may not have, have you know, mechanical experience uh, and they're coming along beside the home buyer. We sort of like the whole model as just an alternative way, another door that a home buyer might be able to walk through that, you know, if they found others close to them, clearly from an economic standpoint, a straight conventional where you get all the, all the benefits of capital gains would be preferable. But if that's not accessible, you know, financially or whatever, uh, for a home buyer, that could be, it could be right for some types of buyers. And we've seen that in the marketplace in the past, and 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 certainly we've had some success with with those programs along the way. And and so I I think we'll continue to see that. You know, depending on on what what market we're in, we'll see some of it more or some of it less, depending on on where things trend. Sure, I, I think it's our job just to be thoroughly educated on them all. And to make sure that the buyers understand, you know, the different paths to purchase that they just may not be aware of. That's why they would use a professional in a transaction like that. They're, they're you know, they may actually be able to afford a house that they don't think they can on paper if we introduce them to some of these programs. Cool. So I kind of thought, yes, looking at the slide deck. Sorry, Randy, go ahead. No, I just wanted to make one more comment in terms of the, the financing piece. You know, obviously... We're, we're very focused on impressing upon the consumer to make sure that, that they have a lender and a reputable lender. And, and obviously with the, the NAR settlement, and we're, we're right there at August 17th and how commissions can be paid and, and all of those pieces coming into a transaction, you know, conventional financing, FHA, VA financing. There's so many different options, and depending on the property, depending on the price point, depending on where it's located, it, it really is a complicated, at times, formula to put together, and it's just critical for, for the consumer to have professionals on all fronts representing them, whether it's a real estate agent or whether it's a mortgage lender or whether it's someone that's providing a service for the purchase of a home. So I think now more than ever, those that are professional in their field are a very important part of the, of the transaction. Yeah, for sure. And I think I, I looked at the slide deck earlier and I know that the triangle area has got a really interesting supply and demand story. I can't wait to hear more about that. Yeah. I think I'm up next. So thanks. Thanks, Jacob. And I'm going to start off by discussing some of the national trends that are some of it is coming off of some of the interest rate trends that Jacob just talked about. I'm also going to be using a lot of data from the National Association of Realtors mid-year report, which kind of came out early this summer. And the, the, this first slide kind of shows the situation with respect to what's being sold nationally. And one thing that this starkly shows when you look at existing home sales is that mortgage lock effect that we've been discussing that, you know, during the low interest rates of 2020 and 2021, a huge amount of home of households rushed out and refinanced their mortgages such that a substantial portion of homeowners have mortgages right now below 4%. And that's preventing them from thinking about selling their home, going out and buying another home at today's today's interest rates. So this kind of starkly shows that effect, you know, when you have 5.3 million, 5.5 million existing home sales before COVID uh, in 2023 and so far in 2024, you know, no surprise, we're, we're trending more towards 4 million existing home sales. So if you, one way to think about that with, you know, one point three or $1.5 million homes missing out of sales of about 5.3 or 5.5 million, about one in four homes that normally are on the market are no longer on the market for the last two years. And that's 
really depress the supply of homes that home buyers, potential home buyers, can look at. Um, now, with respect to new home production, which sort of takes up a little bit of that slack, if you look at that second column, you know we're building about six hundred thousand right before COVID, which is a depressed number. We still haven't fully recovered from the collapse in home construction after the Great Recession, but we're slowly marching our way back. Um, you know that kind of accelerated during COVID, fell with with interest rates, and we're sort of now back to where we were before COVID, if not a little bit more. And so that's taken up some of the slack that the existing home market kind of has for for people looking for a house. Unfortunately, I think because of the relative sizes of these markets, the you know there's there's now a a really large shortfall in competition for people looking to buy an existing house in a certain location, um, and so that has resulted in in high prices for existing homes. And as we'll see later in the chart that just came out a week or so ago, new homes have actually fared a little bit better in terms of pricing today because of, you know, sustaining the supply, if not improving the supply of new homes uh, compared to before COVID. Uh, That said, though, the supply of new homes is still not what it was before the Great Recession of 2007, 2008. So we're still lacking, you know, that still needs to increase uh, beyond what it is today. So if you look at the next slide, it just kind of shows you some expectations of what that might look like. Uh, this is a, a, a blog that I follow in terms of housing that's under construction today. So as you can see, the pipeline is actually pretty good in terms of homes that are permitted but not started, or homes that are under construction at some point, there is a good pipeline so that we may expect more housing supply to deliver in the next couple of years, and therefore hopefully take up some of the slack from the lack of existing home sales. Um, however, due to you know, population growth and, and, you know, and migration, we still need to sustain or even surpass these numbers in order to make up for the decade or so of underproduction that we've seen even with a new housing supply. And if you go to the next slide, we we come to that really strange situation where we find ourselves now that hasn't happened much, but it happened this year, earlier this summer, where because of the lack of existing houses for sale, and the rel- relative robustness of new construction, the national average per square foot price of a for sale house is actually above that of a- an existing house. It-, it hasn't happened often, but it certainly happened this year. And hopefully, you know, that'll come down because that is a, a huge impact on affordability because the existing home market is such a big part of the entire housing market, you know, housing choices for everybody. Um, But that's where we find ourselves in because of the mortgage lock overhang that Jacob kind of alluded to. And with interest rate coming down, hopefully that'll also be an impact in, in the future. And, you know, the last slide, you know, there's, there's a saying that demographics and life choices are housing destiny. And, you know, again, from the National Association of Realtors, they pointed out that, you know, demographics and and things that happen to people that typically generate somebody to sell their house and move to another appropriate housing situation, births, deaths, marriages, new jobs, retirements, those continue. You know, those haven't stopped in spite of what's happening to the, the resale market. And so I think that's led to what I would call pent-up supply. As much as we have pent-up demand, I think we have pent-up supply. A lot of people are living in housing situations that probably aren't optimal or or appropriate for what's happened to their family um, in the last two years. And I think that they're starting, that's starting to overcome a little bit of the mortgage overhang. And 
I think you see that in the statistics where there's, you know, 10 or 15 percent more listings this year than last than last year is because these these pent up supply situations are sort of overcoming that. So that's slowly going to trickle back into the market. Uh, if you look at these numbers, you're comparing this, as I mentioned, to four million houses sold in the last two years, right? So obviously there's a lot more going on with demographics than than the, the resale market is showing. But is it going to be enough to make a big difference in pricing? You know, my sense is probably not. You know, we we also have pent up demand matching this this pent up supply. And so I think house prices are are going to continue to hold. And and unfortunately affordability is is not going to change much unless incomes change a lot in the next couple of years. I think the valve we have is new construction. Um, so it becomes even more important for new construction to hold steady or, or increase. And, and that's continuing past discussions we've had on housing policy, zoning reform, you know, trying to get more product on the market more affordable prices for the for sale market. I was going to ask Eric about those national numbers. Do you think we are looking at a tale of two cities with multifamily and single family? Much of the new construction is uh, uh, multifamily, which you would obviously would be cheaper than single family homes. So, yeah, you're you're absolutely correct, Roberto. M- multifamily construction has actually recovered to levels during the Great Recession of 07 and 08. And so we don't see a pent-up, we don't see as much pent-up demand now in multifamily. In, in some markets, there's already an oversupply. In certain segments, like uh, Class A luxury, there's definitely an oversupply. And, and certainly North Carolina is, is probably seeing some of that. So I think the multifamily market is going to be a, a different story Rents have certainly uh, abated a little bit. I think Jim's going to talk a little bit about that. But the single family definitely is being affected by a different set of trends with a mortgage overhang. Thank you. Great. So I'll pick up from there. And you're going to hear a lot from, on this theme today about supply in the market. And so drilling down from where Eric had us, which is at the national level, I'm going to talk a little bit about the North Carolina North Carolina level, and, and hopefully in future ses- sessions, we'll build out even further and talk about the triangle. But the data I'm showing today is at the state level. And what you're seeing is you're seeing on the slide all residential units that have been permitted in a particular year. So that means that these are permits for single family dwellings, they could be for multi unit dwellings. So almost all of the permitting is either for single family or for multi unit of the five or more units. So there's When you play out the statistics, there's two units, there's three and four units, and then there's five or more units. As I'll show in a future slide, almost everything in this chart is either a single family home or basically a multifamily property. And you can see, this is from 1980 to 2023. You can see in the 80s, there was a spike for most of the 90s and and into 2006. There was very strong new, new permit activity, meaning new production, new supply coming in the market. That fell off a cliff with the Great Recession in 08 and 09. And as has been alluded to several times, it has built back, but it's not yet where it was pre Great Recession. And so you can see that the trailing three year average, if you look at it on a per population basis, so I basically took the population of North Carolina, which is at the moment about 10.8 million people. And you say, okay, well, per 100, every 100,000 people, how many units did we permit, meaning how many units are we producing that year? Uh, the trailing three-month average is about 897. So for over 100,000 people, we're adding 900 units. Again, those units could be multifamily or they could be single family. That compares to, at the peak in the mid-80s, we were producing well over 1,100 units per 100,000. And if you look at the 90s into the 2000s, again, we were over that that 100,000. So we, we've certainly ramped up from where we were in the depths after the Great Recession. We're just getting to the recovery phase. but I want to show you, I want to disaggregate that data for a minute, and I want to show you what the difference is between the single family market and the multifamily market. So now I'm just showing same data set, but just the single family units. So I've taken out the multifamily units, two or more units. I'm saying these are just single family homes, again, in the state of North Carolina. 
And so same general story, a peak in the 80s and then a big peak in the 90s and into the early 2000s, and then a, a dramatic fall off of 75% cut in production during the Great Recession. And now we're about 50%, 60% of where we were pre-2008. So it's getting better. As Eric showed at the national level, that's the same trend at the, in North Carolina. We're, we're producing more single-family homes, but we're still not nearly where we were when we were adding a lot of people during the 90s and 2000s. And as I'll show in a, in a slide in a few minutes, we're still putting a lot of people into North Carolina. Our rate of growth in North Carolina is approximately 1.4% each year. Population grows 1.4% each year. And that's been steady pretty much over the last 43 years of this data set. So you can see for the last 10 years, we really haven't been producing as many single family homes as we should have been given our growth. And when you combine that, that lack of new supply with the lock-in effect that's been talked about here, that's why you have this dramatic reduction in your ability to buy a single family home and prices that continue to go up because there just isn't enough supply for the demand that's being generated. Now, if you go to the next slide, I'm going to contrast that with, this is the multifamily permits. So again, same data set. This is all from the U.S. Census Bureau, same timeline. And you can see for multifamily units, which again, I'm defining as five or more units, in the 80s, huge spike. That's 1985. That was on a 100,000 person basis, we were producing 393 new units. You can see we had a fall off in the early 90s when we had a real estate recession. We came back in the 2000s, but look in the last three years. That's where I want to draw your eyes. So the far right side of that chart, that's 2021, 2022, 2023. That trailing average is 266. So that ranks above all previous totals that we've ever had, except for 1985. So in the last three years, we've had a new record of multifamily deliveries each year. Now, that's great from an overall housing perspective, as, as Eric alluded to, it's actually softening rents. We saw dramatic rent growth during 2000, 2021, 2022. We've seen that rent growth abate. And in fact, in some markets, we're actually seeing some negative rent growth right now, certain submarkets where there's been a tremendous amount of supply delivered. So from a consumer perspective, that's a good thing. But if you talk about the overall housing market, there's been a difference in the composition of supply over the last three years on a relative basis. In other words, there's as a percentage overall, less single family being delivered and more multifamily being delivered, such that the overall supply of new units is approaching where it's been in the past, but that is being that has been comprised of more multifamily and less single family than we've seen in the past, which again goes to the story of why aren't single family prices coming down any, because there's just not enough supply out there. Let me go to the, the next slide. So now what I'm doing is this is total permit activity. So I'm not putting it on a per population basis. I'm just saying, here's the total number of per residential permits. And this is for all units. So the red is your single family and the blue is your multifamily. And you can see some small purple and yellow. That's the two unit and three or four units. So that's almost nothing, right? And you can see, uh, and then and the dotted line above it is the state population growth. So we were at 6 million People in 1980 were about 10.8 million people today. You can see that's been a st steady march upwards. So we should be adding housing each year to accommodate that growth. For the 1990s and 2000s, we were doing that. We stopped doing that in 2008, 2009, 2010. We've restarted that process. We're almost back to where we were in 2006, 2007. But the composition of that, there's a lot less red on that chart, which is a single family, and a lot more blue on that chart, which is multifamily. So that changes your housing options, right? If you're moving to the state of North Carolina, if you're moving to Raleigh, if you're moving to Charlotte, all the growing markets where there's great job growth, you know, the percentage of homes that are out there that are single family are being reduced relative to the, the number of units that are multifamily. And so that, that has, you know, significant impacts on a lot of different things in, within our community. So the question that Eric raised is how do we get more, multi, you know, single family production out there? And there's reform issues and the like, but that that's still a challenge for us today. We see that while multifamily has been doing a great job of delivering over the last couple of years, single family homes have really still struggled, especially relative to, to their historical highs in the 90s and 2000s. And again, I, I think in future conversations, we'd love to drill down in the triangle. My suspicion is in the triangle, it might this probably might be even more acute than you see on a statewide basis. 
because I think as Roberto has alluded to in some of our conversations, there's definitely some movement geographically that's probably not being captured in that data since that's statewide data. I got a question for Randy about the presentation on practitioners. Do you see your clients you work with? We have looked at the slides from a population perspective. Uh, is it like the, your clients are mostly families, so it would be better to look at this based on household formation, households, or most of your clients are single people? And the other question is, are most of your clients looking for a single family or just a unit with a multifamily or single family? So we've got, you know, yes to all of that. We've got folks that are coming from out of state. They are families, they're relocating, and they are looking for single family residential homes. We've got people that are here local and, and maybe they're millennials or they're working for the hospital system. They're working for a number of different employers and they're looking for a multifamily type of dwelling. It really does run the gamut. I would, I would say that we see more of the single family type buyer than we do multifamily. And I know that, that there's projects that are underway that will provide more multifamily. I, I think we run the challenge affordability, and that's really why the multifamily units are coming to market more so than the single family. And, and that really is a big part from what it costs just to try and put a property on a piece of, of land, a raw land. I mean, the, the land cost is, is pretty high. At least when, when we look at Orange, Chatham County, the Triangle, Wake County, that probably is the biggest challenge is finding property that we can build on. And I'll talk from a builder's standpoint, too. I mean, where lot cost, and, and if I look back 08, 09, and we were coming out of the recession in Chatham County, lot cost was 80, 85,000 in North Chatham. Today, it's two fifty dollars to $300,000 for the same type of, of lot to go ahead and build on. So that's going to drive your cost up from where it was six, seven hundred thousand. dollars 700000 Now we're in the mid $1.5 million, $1.3 million, and that's just North Chatham. Similar types of situations are part of what we're having to, to deal with. So you know, I, I think you're going to see more people, even if they're wanting to purchase a single family dwelling detached home, they're going to be hard pressed to do so just because of the financial impact that it's going to have on them. That, that's what I'm feeling. And, and Brett may also have some opinion on this. So feel free, Brett. Yeah, thanks, Randy. I mean, definitely lot cost has gone up significantly. Just overall, everything has still gone up significantly to building too, right? It's tough to build very affordable homes. It's hard to build where the largest demand is for the market. That's another reason why I think you're seeing resale really push up over new, right? Because the new normally would step in and fill the demand in the market, right? It would fill the demand, which is that more affordable, lower price point. But there's an inability to do that given all the market and economic factors in play. And so we're seeing resale really go up uh, to go back quite a few slides ago, you know, being more price per square foot than than new. And it's really, it's making the market harder for it to work out on its own as it normally would. Uh -huh. um, normally it could just ramp up new construction, Randy, right? And provide a lot of what the most demand was and you'd be good. But the economics just don't, they don't pencil out right now for a lot of uh, locations. Yeah. Does that answer your question? Yes, it does. I wonder at what point or if there is a point at which, in, if I'm thinking of moving from a city to North Carolina, I would be reluctant to move to an apartment. I can live in an apartment where I am now, yeah, or a condo. So at some point, the growth will kind of slow down because I would inability to provide what the consumer wants. Well, what you're having to do quite frankly, and if there was, you know, an area that you wanted to to be in, and let's just use Chapel Hill or Carborough as an example, affordability, what's, what's going to be part of the equation now is you're going to have to be further away from Chapel Hill, Carborough, 
to to buy something that that might be within what your financial limits are, right? So we have where Pittsburgh was was a place that was sort of a bedroom community from Chapel Hill. I would anticipate with all that's going on in in Pittsburgh proper that that may end up being somewhat similar to what Chapel Hill Carborough looks like in 20 years. And the bedroom community of Pittsburgh will be Siler City and then moving down into the Sanford area. And so I think you have this this sort of sprawl that's taking place where what were bedroom communities are actually going to be more dense and, and higher priced. And then the sprawl on the bedroom communities will build out from there. And, and that's where affordability is, is going to come to play. And then where, where we do have larger populations of people, um, the, the multifamily unit is what's going to have to try and fill the gap for, from an affordability standpoint. And, and maybe the, the buyer of tomorrow is going to have to make some adjustments into how they live. It may not be that they can afford a detached home on a quarter of an acre because that's not within their price point. And hopefully municipalities and those that have the ability to control things in terms of what's, what's going to be allowed and, and permitted, the multifamily units will be something that will allow for them to live closer in and, and have, a, have a place that they can call home and, and be able to work, live, and play in the same community. Thank you. Yeah, and I will, I will say this too, right? Like we definitely need a lot more homes built in the Triangle, in North Carolina. Uh, but we really need all types, a lot of all types of housing built. People will say there's too many apartments and whatnot. You know, yes, they build a lot of apartments in the triangle for sure. Yes, the rents aren't always cheap, but you still have people moving from other locations where the rents have gone up even more. Florida, for instance, a lot of people coming back from Florida where rents have doubled in some instances, and they can come here, get a very good paying job. The job market is still extremely strong, and they're happy to do that. And it's still a savings and cost of living for them to come here. But yeah, we need we need all types of housing in North Carolina to, to meet the growing demand, or we will start limiting our ability to land other economic development projects. Well, this is a really good segue into affordability. Thank you, Andrea. So my interest, after looking at the data that uh, Matt sent us about the affordability index that they track over time continues to go down, becoming more and affordable, um, I decided to look at what happened with the non-mortgage ownership costs. As not just the stuff that Jacob talked about, interest rates, uh, obviously prices. And I look at the, obviously, property taxes, homeowners association fees, maintenance, repairs, utilities, and, of course, homeowners insurance that have been in the news over the last few months. Nationally, over the last four years, the non-mortgage ownership costs went up 26%. Um, in North Carolina, that number is 31%. That's a huge number and huge increase. And unfortunately, as we look into the future, as Jacob told us, interest rates may get lower, so mortgage payment may be lower, but these non-mortgage costs are likely to continue to go up. So it really creates a, a, an affordability challenge that at least at the moment there is no like an easy policy solution. As you can expect, places like California, Hawaii, New Jersey, these uh, non-mortgage ownership costs are huge, uh, greater than $25,000 a year. The good news about North Carolina is that we rank among the lowest, least cost costly with these non-mortgage ownership costs. So I think the cheapest is Mississippi, about 12000 So we are about 15000 That is not that much more. So. If you look at the average mortgage payment, and again, I got this from the data, about 22 a month or 26000 a year. And if you add the no mortgage ownership cost of 15000 a year, you look at about $41,000 devoted to housing. And this is a huge amount of money. And again, if you use the rule of thumb, we're using housing policy or spending a third of your income after tax on housing, we are looking at maybe an income of 120, 130 and above. So the, when we buy a house, I really didn't look at these non-mortgage ownership costs. I just 
incur them as they can. But I think they are going to become even more significant as we continue to see them increasing and the mortgage cost of the equation continue to go to go down. Next, one of the aspects that has gone out significantly is the homeowners insurance. And the reason I wanted to look at this more carefully was that there have been a number of symposiums and panels and convenings uh, from the industry, government, financial markets. Nobody seems to have a solution to this problem yet. The owners who renewed their income insurance last year, the cost went up or the premium about 20%. So that's a huge amount of money. I look at North Carolina and the number is close to 10%. So in North Carolina, we are doing better in terms of increases. But again, this is an average and includes places that are low risk, where you have a much lower increase in North Carolina and places like the eastern part of the state where insurance uh, premiums have gone significantly higher. Um, There have been some research about why is driving these higher insurance costs. And obviously, most people talk about climate-related events tornadoes, storms, wildfires in the western part of the country. Also, houses have appreciated over time, and so the value of the want you want to insure is higher. Cost of materials and labor is much higher, and so you have supply chain issues, inflation. So if anything happens to a home and needs to be fixed, it will cost much more to fix than before. There are fewer carriers willing to write policies in certain high-risk areas. And I don't know if you all may recall, I think it was last year, uh, Nationwide, for example, decided not to renew the policy of about 10,000 residents, uh, households in eastern North Carolina, because they said it was just not profitable for them because of the storms were frequent and severe in there. Houses also are getting older. We talk about existing homes, and so a roof is old, needs to be replaced. All that stuff affects the insurance premiums. Since COVID, a lot of households have made also repairs and additions. They haven't moved, but they have kind of improved their living environment by adding a room or an office. Um, uh, and so these kind of uh, added value to a home, which increased, the, obviously, the amount that needs to be covered, raising the premium. Owners also may have filed a claim from last year's storm, and so that kind of make the premium go up. And finally, as we all know, credit scores are a key determinant of uh, insurance premiums, regardless of claims. And as households have been loading up on their credit card, and as we know, the credit card debt has reached almost um, a trillion dollars, I think, um, so they are maxed out. That affects their credit score, which makes them uh, more expensive to insure. And finally, research seems to suggest that these higher reinsurance costs are a big part of the equation. As purely you all know, uh, insurance companies cover the risk through the premiums, but then they buy themselves reinsurance in these reinsurance markets. Reinsurance markets are global. So this includes big capital firms that operate all over the world. And so whether there is a flooding in Bangladesh or things happening in in Africa, all these stuff are covered by the same companies. And so the reinsurance costs for these companies have gone out significantly, even if we haven't had many storms to warrant that kind of increases. Unfortunately, experts tell us that these insurance premiums, because what is driving the insurance costs, are con- is going to continue to raise, to go up. And so, like I said, people have been gathering and talking to stakeholders, trying to come up with some solution. The mortgage industry, mortgage insurance industry, wants the states to reinsure them, and then the federal government to reinsure the states. They've been talking about this for many years. Uh, that obviously hasn't happened. The, there are many in government or experts say that the government should not get that role. It's a matter of making the capital markets work better. Anyway, there is no clear solution, and neither party candidate for president can make any statement about this issue. Uh, we all know that it's a problem, but nobody wants to put their fingers on, the, on, the, on that issue. 
So given that this is likely to continue to increase, we see some impacts both in the rental market and in the single family homeownership market. In the rental market, uh, people adjust to these high insurance premiums by reducing coverage, choosing high deductible, reducing amenities and services. Unfortunately for affordable housing providers, they cannot pass the higher cost to their tenants. Many of them are on the program that max their te- the rent they can pay. And so it really puts a squeeze in many of these housing providers that may impact the long-term viability of many of these housing developments. Um, also, I think Randy mentioned, many projects, new development, are much difficult to write now, pencil and close because these high insurance premiums kind of not working with the high rates and the expected increase in the premiums. FHA has re- revised their underwriting projections and now they consider higher insurance costs going forward. That is a good thing if we, should, if we keep FHA viable going forward, but because homeowners have to pay for that, the amount of loans that they can get back by FHA is smaller now. So, again, they know like a clear solution about how this can be solved. On the homeownership side, it's difficult to obtain sufficient insurance at a reasonable price. For existing FHA combi- uh, borrowers, many of them are low income. We see that they will have problems with affordability. And at some point, they will not be able to afford the insurance, especially those living in high risk areas like Eastern North Carolina. When homeowners cannot obtain insurance, the servicer is required to purchase it for them. And this is not a good thing for the consumer because typically the servicers buy these forced price insurance policies, hugely expensive, which makes the affordability constraint and problems for the consumer and their ability to meet mortgage payment even more difficult. So going forward, we think that this is going to become an issue for home buyers and for home sellers. People are going to become more difficult to sell a home if any potential buyer can get an ins- homeowner's insurance at a reasonable price or at all. And these high insurance costs may make less affordable, which will reduce them buyer participation in the market. So at the moment, I think things are, people are becoming aware of this. But I think it's as interest rate go down, this is going to become even more relevant because it will be the part of their ownership code that will continue to go up. Um, so on that, I guess somber note, I will um, um, I'll let Jeremy continue. Any questions or comments about this? Jeremy, can you figure out a way to put a positive spin on the last set of slides? That's a good question. <laughs> uh, I'll, I'll do my best. But yeah, thanks, Roberto, for, for setting that up. Uh, after we had a conversation a few days ago, and we can go to the next couple of slides here. Yeah, right here. And the question came up about property taxes. And I've done some work on this, but I was thinking of my own property taxes. And I said, hey, when was the last time my house was reassessed? Because I think it's been pretty similar cost for the last several years. And so I went to go to Google, which is what you do. And I found this North Carolina Department of Revenue sort of table that shows sort of when homes were last assessed and when they are scheduled to be assessed next. And so I just wanted to go over a couple of the rules that it sort of says within here, within the bottom sort of footnotes of this table. Um, it says property is supposed to be assessed at 100% of their appraised value. And I, you know, I should look into this because I think I've got some data and a new set of data, but I don't know, is it's for the practitioners in here, I don't know, are we at an appraisal rate, do you think of 100% of value? It's an interesting question, but a lot of houses in the triangle have exploded in value in the last four or five years. And so I was interested in knowing if when they are reappraised in the near future, are we going to see a giant jump in property tax cost? And so I ended this really simple, how much do I think property tax will change? And it's just sort of a function of what's your rate multiplied by whatever the future appraisal will be. And for today in this simple table, I'm just gonna use what's the value of the home today. And then I'm gonna subtract away from that the last time it was appraised. And so I'm doing some Pretty strong assumptions here. It's just the January of, of the year that you were last appraised. And so if you go to the next slide, here on the left, I've got the counties within the triangle. And then the next column is the tax rate. The next column is when it was last appraised, when the county said it was going to be appraised by. And then the next column is really the important one. If you look down this, you'll notice 
a lot of counties, Chatham and Durham, for instance, are going to be having their new appraisals sort of be effective for next year. And so if you look at a county like Chatham, it, it's up about 55%. These are just comparing medians across National Association of Realtor county level averages, sorry, averages and medians, but 55% from 2021 to 2025, Durham is significantly higher, but it's going back to 2019. But if you just take the difference in sort of the dollar between the current value and sort of the last median value from whatever, 2019, let's say for Durham, and then you multiply that by what the rate is, I mean, it's eighteen, nineteen hundred dollars $1,900 that we're expecting someone that's going to have that much higher property tax rate when they're reassessed for uh, next year. Not all counties are, are being reassessed next year, but Chatham, Durham, Orange, Person, a lot of these ones are, are going to be sort of done there. And they weren't sort of appraised until I would argue before that sort of giant increase in value we saw sort of in 2021, sort of the tail end of COVID. And so that's just sort of not a positive spin, Jacob, I'm sorry, but it's positive that home prices are up. That's awesome. And that's great. But one of the costs- Hey, Jeremy, I can- Yeah, go ahead, Matt. Jeremy, it's Matt from, it's Matt from Triangle. I'll, I'll save you a little bit. I spoke, to a, I, sp- I spoke to a, a Wake County commissioner about this issue and I was showing her a, a, a chart that showed this, you know, this huge increase in appraised value and she said that they actually adjust the rates as well. Okay. So they will adjust the rate or the rates down to hit yeah. a level budget target. And it's not level. They'll say, you know, increase it by 6% or something to account for whatever their, you know, their plans are. But they, there's some kind of, you know, um, uh, threading of the needle there where they yeah. will, will, will have the total appraised uh, 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 ad valorem result come back. And then they'll say, okay, well, to get the total we need, the rate needs to be X, and they'll set the rate to that. Uh, so the, I guess there is some good news that the tax payers bad. are not no, expected. Not yeah. yeah, they're going to, we don't get to be wrong. Everybody's paying more, right? Yeah. Everybody's going to pay more, but not the yeah. full boat of whatever yeah. your house is, has appreciated, right? Yeah, there's research that says that they would often change the assessed value. You're saying that, in, and I was worried on the last slide, if we go back real quick, it says that, hey, it has to be assessed at the actual value. That sort of mm-hmm. first part that I was worried. That's true. So, yeah, sounds like they are just going to change yeah, that, the rate. So that, that could be a positive spin, Jacob. How about that? It may not be as bad as we thought it was going to be. There you go. Thanks, Matt. I, thank you. Thanks for bailing me out. Uh, here's another positive thing, particularly for those that currently own a home. So I was sitting at lunch the other day and I saw this giant poster on the wall that was sort of talking about how great Apex was to live, 2015 Money Magazine, best place to live in America. And I started thinking about everyone of my neighbors and sort of people that I know who have moved here. And a lot of the individuals that I know who have moved here, I was thought, hey, they're coming from sort of higher cost of living areas. And myself, I'm included in this. I moved here 13 years ago or so. And I'm not trying to dissuade migration, not trying to sort of say we should be, be mean to these individuals from moving here. I uh, just want to put that up front. And this is a very simple study that I ran here, but I was interested in knowing kind of where are people, where's our supply coming from? This our demand coming from for this market. And a lot of this is coming from the fact that there's a ton of new jobs in the area. Uh, there's a bunch of places they're saying it's the best place to retire, the best place to live. And so individuals are moving here in response to that. And that's great. And that's good. But we need to kind of keep in mind that sort of the, the demand in this market may be coming from places where sort of their original cost of housing, and I think Brett mentioned this earlier and other people have, was much higher. And one of the reasons they're looking here is because housing is relatively cheaper. And so if we go to the next slide, um, I just looked at the census's data on sort of metro to metro migration, and I'm only looking at sort of outside of North Carolina coming in. And this is sort of the highest flows of the triangle. And so it's areas like Atlanta, Washington, D.C., area, New York, Philadelphia, Seattle, You've also got areas like San Jose and stuff. And so I was wondering, like, the places that are coming in, what was the typical median home price sort of in their area? And it's not across the board that it's higher, but there are several areas, Los Angeles, that's, you know, double, at least as far as, like, housing costs are concerned. And so I, I've seen this, and I was just wondering if it's sort of true in reality, is what was sort of the, the thought that I wanted to do here, which is that a lot of the individuals I see moving in are coming from really high cost of living areas and potentially bringing some of the equity from their house into this market. And so that's going to have sort of a, a sort of increase in sort of demand for these homes. 
And I think in some ways we've kind of seen that home prices here are becoming closer and closer to sort of typical home prices of neighboring areas as well, sort of higher, higher cost neighboring areas. So I did a very simple study. I don't want you to sort of peer review this too hard, Jacob, but if you go to the next slide, what I did is I just sort of regressed or sort of wanted to know the relationship between the home price in the individual's home market where they originally were and sort of what the migration rate is from that home market, the CBSA is what it's called, to the triangle. And essentially, I find that like a 1% increase in prices is sort of having a three quarter percent increase in, in migration rates to the triangle. So there is this sort of positive relationship between these these two things that home prices in a home place in a home market may be pushing people to sort of a more affordable market, which is here. Although in some ways, I think it's becoming slightly less. And that was sort of some of what Roberto was talking about and we've talked about in the past, which is this is a nice area and that's great. But prices are sort of adjusting to take that into account now that it's become more public how nice this area is. So that's what I have. And if you're interested in things, we're going to have a new RA sort of at UNC. So questions like this that you want to see investigated with some of your data or other data, let us know for sure because those are things that we can look into and sort of share at these quarterly roundtables. Um, Jeremy, as you look at the changes in migration and price. Do you think the increasing avail uh, preponderance of investors, buyers in the market can affect that relationship? So you mean, say so that one more time, the second part of that. The yeah, of there is more of, especially in Durham, I know that last year, a high proportion of the sales were buyers, were investors. Yeah. So those don't come from high cost areas, but they do impact. Yeah. In this particular very simple study, it's literally just looking at migration from CBSA to here. So you'd have to physically live here. But you're right. If we were to have a large number of investors, for instance, buying a home so they could put it on Airbnb or something, that would not show up in this data. And I know certain areas, I know Phoenix in particular has a, I don't know if I want to use the word problem, but there's a lot of individuals who are buying investor properties that are not being lived in full time by that individual. And there's been some pushback from an affordability perspective. Thanks. Matt, do you have that information about investors, buyers, somewhere in, in your system? Only passively, Roberto. We've done some studies where we look at things like the presence of LLC or INC in the buyer's name. We don't have a formal uh, setting uh, that says whether the buyer was, you know, what the, the tax filing status of the buyer was, for example. But the data does exist in the public records data sets that we license through a company called CRS. We also license data through CoreLogix, a realist system. And that has some kind of back-end ways to look at whether it was a corporate buyer. And we get a lot of questions about that from the media, of course, about whether that's having a nefarious impact on, on supply. And you know, there are movements around famously in Canada restricting the purchase of properties by residential properties by corporations. Um, it's been in the teens every time we've done a study. It fluctuates from 12% to 15%, never out of the teens and never above about 18% that I've seen in any given quarter. But that's, that's a sixth, approaching a fifth of, of home sales in the marketplace. Um, and, you know, there are all sorts of trouble, troubling thoughts about all of those coming back on the market at a, a greater rate than organic sales would, would you know, would experience and coming off the market at, in, in similar fashion, creating uh, supply bottlenecks or, or, or the opposite. Uh, so we, we watch it and we understand that it's, it definitely has an impact on 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 the supply it may have some impact on the new home sales as well and their percentage versus the resales it's interesting i think you know the the reason that we that we do these i i think the reason that triangle set out to set up this partnership with with keenan flagler and to have the intern that we have is to be able as jeremy was just saying to be able to come together and answer a, a questions that happen you guys should know that you have access to things like current demand data and how many showings there were in a price bracket in a particular county indicating what forward-looking demand might be 
I'm really interested in getting that out in front of decision makers and developers who might be looking for that next place to build a subdivision. Um, it'd be great if it wasn't, you know, if, if it didn't end up looking like it was built by ants. You know, at one point that there was some plan here, not to diss the ants, they probably do a better job than we do. But we just mentioned Charlotte and all of the sprawl, which we also mentioned that's happening down there. And I think we have a special group of communities, Carborough, Chapel Hill, the ones that Randy were just mentioning, and we can add value to those communities that last for decades if we make smart land use decisions now. So my hope is that policymakers will know about this podcast and that the data is available and that these professionals are are focused on the same thing together. We just you know want to build better cities that we all live in. And, you know, make sure there is a place for the server to live. And for the, the math teacher that we talked about last year in Cary, we ran a, a news article entitled, Math Teachers Can Still Buy a House in North Carolina. And, you know, we'd rather not live in a place where they can't. So let's see what we can do to kind of shine a light on the need for that, for that price bracket. Uh, thank you. Yeah, thanks everybody. That was a great conversation. Mm-hmm.